been looking forward to this and it's a very, um, it's gonna be very interesting and fun. Um, I wanna let you know what we have coming up next week. Um, we have Unsolved Hollywood Murders one week from tonight on uh, Thursday, January 27th at 7 p.m. Um, you know, celebrities are in the spotlight, but that doesn't always save them from uh, being murdered <laughs> or from getting justice because many of these murders are unsolved. Um, some are closed, well, not closed, but they, they've reached dead ends and others are very much open and still being investigated. So um, we're going to be hearing the stories about some of these unsavory murders in Hollywood. So if you're a true crime buff or a celebrity buff, please join us next uh, Thursday. Uh, go online and register. It's a virtual program, just like tonight's. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, as we were discussing earlier, it's great we don't have to go out in the weather. Uh, <laughs> for a program we can be in the comfort of our nice, hopefully warm homes and enjoying this program. Uh, Sydney Sherman is here tonight to help us understand, she, she's up there in the corner waiting at us. Um, she, she's gonna help us understand what an aura is and um, how it can improve our lives. There, from my understanding, there are different colors associated with auras and Sydney will be explaining to us um, how these different colors, um, what characteristics they bring out in, in, in us. So to help us understand ourselves and our auras, please welcome Sydney Sherman. Hi everyone, thank you, Janet, and thank you. Uh, this is a great crowd I can tell already. Uh, for those of you who I cannot see because I can't fit everybody's face on the screen, I'm sorry. I, I usually like to personally call out each person's name, but uh, I guess that's not going to happen. But thank you for coming. And uh, I have not been either physically and or otherwise at Rolling Meadows, so I'm very excited. And I hope tonight that you're going to learn a lot of new things about yourself, things that you probably should have known all your life, and we're going to talk about that. But what I usually do is start with a little conversation about myself, because if I don't, What's usually going to happen is people always say to me, well, how does she know that? What is she basing that on? Where does she get that information from? So if I just tell you ahead of time, then you already know. Um, my wonderful assistant Peggy is there. She's going to put some information in the chat. And she's also going to talk a little bit later about pets. And uh, any questions that you have, <clears throat> I ask that you save them until the end, only because chances are probably I'm going to answer your question throughout the presentation. It's usually what happens. Peggy can answer a lot of your questions for you, but she does know the ones that I prefer to answer personally myself. And at the end, of course, there will be questions and answers. So a little bit about me. I was born in Milford, Connecticut in 1962. Yes, I'm very old and I'm gonna be 60 in July. And uh, I was born to a very normal family, <clears throat> extremely normal family. I mean, uh, I was the youngest of four children. I had two older brothers and an older sister. My father was a workaholic and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. I was in Girl Scouts and Brownies and uh, ballet and I mean, we did Sunday car rides, you know, just like everybody else did. We were no different. I didn't notice there was anything different or a little strange about my family. I mean, pretty much when you're a kid, you think that what's going on in your home is probably going on in everybody else's home. Uh, until I was in kindergarten and I was standing outside my classroom in the line with the rest of the kids and I was talking to my friend Ellen. And all of a sudden, a little girl, and I'm going to call it spirit girl right now, for now, I don't really like that term, but we'll use that for now, came up and started talking to me. Well, you know, I mean, I started talking back. I was used to this. But right away, my friend Ella wanted to know, who are you talking to? And I thought she was trying to just joke with me. I mean, we were little, uh, but I, you know, said the girl and she started saying there's nobody there. So I really thought she was making fun of me. Well, one thing led to another and She's saying that I'm talking to nobody and she says I'm talking to the air and uh, the kids in the line are making fun of me and they're laughing and I didn't understand why. So I called her stupid. She called me stupid and I ran home crying to my mother. When I got home, uh, once my mother got over the shock of me being back home from school, I told her what happened. At the time, my papa, my grandfather, who's very instrumental to everything you're going to hear tonight, she looked at him and he was there at the house and she said, okay, take her. And I'm like, wait, take me what? Does anybody listen to me? I'm, I'm, I'm upset here. Nobody's paying attention to me. And uh, my grandfather was a wonderful man. 
Uh, he did not live with us at the time, but I got to give you a little background on him, just a little sidebar, because uh, again, he's very important to tonight's conversation. My grandfather was born on the Penobscot uh, Reservation, and he lived there all of his life until he was 22. And that's in Maine. And, uh, you know, for those of you who may or may not know anything about the Penobscot Reservation, they are not a casino tribe. They are very poor still to this day. They have little huts that they live in. There was no formal education. There still really isn't. There was definitely no jobs. And the primary thing to do was to drink. So there was a lot of alcoholics and there still is to this day. So my grandfather came to uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut when he was 22 and met my grandmother. They got married. They had several children, but this is how their life was. My grandfather would get drunk. My grandmother would throw him out. My, uh, the police department would come pick him up. It was the normal thing. <clears throat> the reason they pick him up is because my father worked for the police department and they knew him. So my father would have to go to the police department, pick him up, how embarrassing. He would come back to our house for three days of detox. And then he would go back to my grandmother, wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over again. So it was one of these detox sessions that he was at our house. So when he took me outside and some of you who are older, <laughs> Use the word older. We'll remember the old fashioned station wagons with the wood paneling on the side. Anybody remember those? And they had the third seat that faced the back. It was always exciting. We uh, went out in the third seat and we sat down. And he said to me, he goes, you know, Sydney, you see who you see and you hear who you hear and that's okay. But you have to shh. Well, I mean, what does a six year old know about shush? I mean, they don't. I mean, I'm going to be 60. My assistant can tell you, I still don't know anything about shush. I was born with the gift gab, right, Peggy? Uh, I already know she's making fun of me, so I'm going to ignore her. So I didn't know what he was talking about. What? Shush. You know, back in the day, for those of you who are young, it was not like it is now. Parents did not share things with you. When a, an adult told you there was a secret or shush, it was, it was scary. I mean, you didn't even think about asking your father how much money he made. It's just that children were supposed to be, what, seen and seldom heard. So I was unnerved. He explained to me what I had occurred. And I'm going to explain it to you, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put your six-year-old brains back on, listen to what I'm going to say, not as an adult, but as a child, a child that's not biased and doesn't know the world. And when I'm done, I want you to think about if you would have understood what he was trying to say. I don't think you will. So my grandfather was a naturalist, as I am, and he felt that our energy, our aura, that we have comes from the universe. It originally comes from the universe. And until we get our physical body or our candy coated shell, as he put it, we are in the energy form. So here's our energy form. Energy is free flowing, it never moves. And it's constant, it doesn't stop. Our mother gets pregnant and we get a candy coated shell or an M&M as I thought about it as a kid. This is our physical self. This is time stamped. It can only last so long. This can get cancer, diabetes, COVID, a respiratory infection. This can have psychiatric problems, depression, anxiety. This is frail. It's only meant to be here for a short time. This is our energy. This is our life source. This is what actually makes us live. But this is how we all are right now. At the time of our death, for whatever reason, there's a separation of this physical self from the energy. Physical self goes in the ground or cremated, whatever your choice is, but you are still here. That which makes you who you truly are is still here. I was six. How many of you would have gotten that? Don't think you would have. Honestly, my first thought was pop up streaking again. Honestly, that's what I thought. But I could tell by the look on his face that he was so serious. And I was even more scared. I, I think he tried... I think about it as I get older, you know, was there any really good way to tell a six-year-old what they were seeing? And now for the first time, I'm learning that these people that I'm seeing, and I've always seen, that other people aren't necessarily doing that, you know, except for my crazy family members. But the worst thing is, and he started telling me they're dead. Now, I didn't know anything about death. Nobody in my family had died. I had never been to a funeral. We didn't talk about dead. So now I'm really freaked out. It was not a good day. Again, I think he meant for it to be a day that we'd sit down and share a bond, but that's not how it went. So I have to tell you that um, I think I did a pretty good job for the most part of shh, but I was a kid. So in my first book, which is You Were Not Alone, right here, 
know if you can see it. that's pop up just for the record my grandfather right there um i tell us a couple stories a couple of stories about um you know different things that happened in, in growing up in my childhood and again when i'm talking about auras i'm talking about energy i'm talking about your energy i'm talking about our loved one's energy there's no difference we both have the same energy the only thing is we have this and they don't so it's still connected to auras so when i was uh in second grade we were playing a game called duck duck goose i'm not sure if you remember it or not because they're not allowed to play it anymore you can play dodgeball and throw a ball at somebody's head but you can't you know touch them so i was never picked i hated the game so i used to sit there and just wait for the horror to be over i wasn't popular i was not a popular kid and here comes the most popular kid in second grade and he comes around, taps me on the head, says boost and starts running. Well, I break. My first thought is, and ladies, you'll understand this. Mike, you might not. But ladies, <laughs> within a few seconds, this is what went through my mind. Number one, does he like me? Does he like me or does he just like me like me? Or does what it, and am I his girlfriend? <laughs> his girlfriend. But the other thing that came through my head was, oh, now I have to pick a popular kid because if I pick a popular kid, then I'll be popular because that's how it works. So um, I get up and I start looking around the circle to see if I can find a popular kid. And halfway around the circle is this girl, this little girl sitting down on the ground, about as pathetic as I was, never got picked either. And a woman standing behind her saying, pick her. Well, I don't want to pick her. She's not popular. But my mother raised me right. I got around the circle, tapped her on the head. I said, goose, and I went running. And I quickly realized she was not following me. So I go back. I stand behind her. But this time, I don't move. I tap her on the head. I say, goose, she'll move. She doesn't look up. She doesn't do anything. So what do I do? Same thing you would have done. I turned around, looked at the woman. I said, she's goose. She told me to pick her. She won't get up. She's goose. And the whole circle of kids is laughing at me again. It's kindergarten all over again. And I was like, rah, rah, because I wasn't supposed to say anything. I was young. So I ran to the classroom and I just waited for those kids to come back in from recess. And I just knew they were going to just tear me up. But they didn't. When they came in, they sat down, they took their desks, they were quiet. The teacher, Miss Tingley, favorite teacher in the world, came up to me and she said, Sydney, you want to go outside and clap racers? Okay, so first of all, <laughs> again, for those of you who are young, uh, Mike, I think you maybe understand this, but some of you might not. You know, years ago, it was so much fun to go outside and, and take the chalk and just like clap those racers. First, you got outside. It was kind of fun. These poor kids nowadays with a dry erase board, I mean, they'll never know the joy of getting the chalk all over their hands, all over their face, up their nose, right? Or taking those erasers and making dragons on the side of the brick wall. And anyway, I digress. So while we're in there, out there, just me and her, she didn't say a word to me. She didn't say anything. And I didn't say anything to her. So we're getting ready to walk in. She puts her hand on my shoulder and she says, you know, Sydney, we're all a little different. I always wondered, did she know? Was she just being kind, comforting? I wish I'd asked her. I didn't. So, you know, I went on with the rest of my uh, life as a child. A few other things happened. For the most part, I think I did pretty good. And then when I started to get older and I started to see the poltergeist and the Amityville horror and all those shows coming out, that represents what happens to our energy, our aura when we die i was very frustrated because i mean at this point in time i'm old enough now i'm seeing it i understand the difference now i understand completely now what my pop-up was trying to tell me i mean I, I can rationalize it but i'm watching people in the store and their loved ones will put their aura on their loved one and we always react we will stop for a second we might look around we might look down but they'll stop they'll even brush their shoulder off and they'll look behind them but they'll go right back to doing what they're going to do and I hope after tonight you won't, because it's, it's too important to understand that you have to understand that we don't go anywhere. Our energy is here when we're alive and our energy stays here after we're dead. It's called our aura. And when we do the PowerPoint, I'm going to explain it and put it all together for you. So you understand why scientific reason to substantiate why we are still here. And yes, there is a scientific reason. You know, it, it upsets me for many years when I hear them say that, uh, you know, we don't know what happens when we die. Yeah, we do. It has been well documented for well over 104 years. If you go back, and this is where I say my favorite part, everything I'm talking to you tonight, everything I discuss with you, everything that's in any of my books, any of my presentations, you can research yourself and find everything that I'm saying in your local library. 
Go visit your local library. Everything's right there for you. You know, you can listen to what people are telling you, but the knowledge is there. And there is documentation and proof from scientists and physicists and biologists of what happens when we die and the fact that, yes, we are still here. Why it's not discussed, I'll let you, you know, figure that out. So um, I just got really upset with the way people were ignoring things. So I, I started to try to tell people without letting my secret out. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't really get very far. I did form the first, um, if they call it now, a paranormal group in New England in 1978. It was called Connecticut Ghost Hunters. If I had to do all over again, I'd never use the word ghost because I hate that word. But, you know, I was a teenager. But it was my way of getting out there to let people know that their loved ones were still around. So I went on to college. I became a registered nurse. And I really started to get into anything that had to do with energy and auras, anything. Um, I studied thanatology. I do still do study thanatology. For those of you who don't know what thanatology is, it's a big name that means a whole bunch of things. Um, thanatology is the study of the essence of life, the process of life, birth, life, life into death, the death process and the afterlife. It's like soup to nuts. It's everything. Most of the time, most people will see it used in, say, hospice situations and things like that. But it really is a wonderful thing. It should be taught in every single school, every single school from a time we're little, because it's something we need to know and is scientifically based. So if you ever get a chance, go to your library, look up thanatology, start reading, you'll be thrilled. So I got married, I had two children. And then in 2010, the show started coming out again, Ghost Hunters and paranormal state, paranormal puppy noise. And I'm like, that is it. I cannot stand the misinformation, the ridiculous baloney nonsense. I can't. And I'm an adult now. And I'm a wife and I'm a mother and I can do what I want. So I looked at my husband. And I said, I'm writing a book. My husband says, but sweetheart, you don't even read. Okay. That's not true. I do a lot of reading, uh, mostly science stuff, but you know, I don't, I don't do as much reading probably as most people. So I did. I sat right here in my little house. And that was the first book that I just showed you. We're not alone. This book right here, the reason I wrote this is because I wanted to give people the basics, just the basics of what happens after we die, right from the science books, right from personal experiences from other people. And I didn't expect it to be anything that great. I mean, I'm a nurse. I really, I'm not an author. Well, I am because I wrote a book, but I'm not, you know, technically an author. And I really felt that a few people would purchase my book, feel sorry for me. A few libraries here in the area said, hey, why don't you come do a book signing? And they were very kind. And that's actually how I got my, my start so long ago. Um, next thing I know, um, I'm all over the place and I'm on TV and I'm on radio and I'm in the newspaper and I'm in journals. And again, if you all see me here, you spend enough time with me now. This is kind of like the face you want to see on radio. It's not, I'm not all glam and I didn't like it. I really, really didn't like it. But it was making people notice it. It was making people understand their aura, their energy, and things like that. So it was worth it. So this book, this little tiny itty bitty book, this little novel, it's not a novel. It's what I like to call a two bathroom read, three if you're having trouble, um, has been bought, read, and sold on every continent except Antarctica. And I can't see Peggy, so I'm not going to call her out on this time here, but Peggy, my assistant, has a book that she says she's sending to Antarctica to the scientists that are there. I don't believe there's scientists there that want to read my book. And I think they're just penguins. And as far as I know, penguins don't read. But the point is the book is done very, very well. And the reason the book's done very, very well is because it's easy to read. It's like I'm talking to you right now. It's based on science. And most people come back to me and say, oh my God, I, I had these experiences. I didn't know what they were. I've had these things happen to me before. And that's exactly what I wanted. So I went on to write another book, another book after that. I'm done. There's no more. I was going to write a book on auras, and I'll explain at the end why, but I'm not going to do it now. And, and hopefully you'll understand. So this is pretty much what I do now. I do a lot of education. It is all based on aura. You cannot understand life. You cannot understand death unless you understand what an aura is. So thank you for listening. Now you'll understand my background a little bit. Let's talk about auras. So your aura is your energy field that surrounds your body, okay? Everybody has one. Anything that is a living, viable entity has an aura. So, aura. so yes, trees, birds, insects, grass, 
leaves, us, dogs, cats, rats. My water bottle does not, the water inside it does, okay? So energy is around us all over the place. And before I go into the whole part of auras, I need to tell you one thing. It's gonna make sure that you understand everything Go for it. It's very simple. When I was in seventh grade, I had a teaching aide, Mr. Jurasco, and he was teaching us about the law of conservation of energy. I don't know if any of you remember that or not, but you might remember it by energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be manipulated and altered, and, but it, it's, it's constant, it's there. We, everybody had known about that by then, that all the biologists, theorists, physicists, every one of them agreed and knew that we were energy beings. There's no doubt, nobody disagrees. It makes what makes us work, what makes us tick is energy. Our energy is what makes us work and we expel energy. The universe uses energy to work and it expels energy, okay? So as I'm listening to him talk about this law of conservation of energy, the theory energy cannot be created or destroyed. I'm thinking about it and he explained. So if energy cannot be created, that is a theory that people use for the science of reincarnation. Now, up until recently, my assistant would be able to tell you, I didn't have a stance one way or the other on reincarnation. I honestly didn't know. I need science to support or experiences to support what I talk about. Otherwise, I don't talk about it. And so for a long time, I told people, yeah, I guess the science is kind of there, but I just ain't going down that road yet. Well, just recently, I did some digging and I did find some stuff that I am willing to put my stamp of approval on to show and prove that in fact there is reincarnation. It does happen. It's also very well documented. And um, I actually have new presentations that I'm going to be doing based on that, which I think really floors Peggy because for years I said I was not going to do that. So if energy cannot be created, does it make sense that your energy, because you are energy, has been here for the millennium and after when you pass with only one time to have the candy coated shell? Does it make sense that you only get one time to be Sylvia, to be Janet? Does it make sense? People said for years, no, it doesn't. Well, I agree with them now. They're absolutely right. It does not make sense. But if energy cannot be destroyed and you are an energy being, there's no doubt about that, then technically when you die, you're still here. If energy cannot be created or destroyed, if it cannot be destroyed, this can, this is frail, this is physical, it goes. You're still here. When my teacher said that, my brain went, Phew. that's what Pop-Up was trying to tell me so long ago in that station wagon when I was in kindergarten. He wouldn't have known the terms, he wouldn't have known the word, the science behind, but he knew. He absolutely knew. And in that one theory right there is the process for life and death. It's all about energy, folks. You're not going to get, you're not doing anything in your life. Every moment of every day that doesn't have anything to do with energy or you're not creating it or you're not using other people's energy and they're using yours. That's just the way it goes. Now, the study of auras, it's not new. And when people come around and say, oh, like this is 70s with mood rings, mood rings have nothing to do with auras, okay? Um, you cannot take a picture of auras. Curling and photography has nothing to do with auras. That's your heat signature. That's your heat coming off your body. So people are lying when they say they can take a picture of auras. But the study and the science of auras has been going on since 1864. It's a long time. It's older than me. Uh -huh. It's old. It's not new. We've known about this. This or study of how our aura affects us, good and bad, what it tells us about ourselves is huge. And hopefully you'll understand when I turn my slideshow on in a minute that um, you'll see how huge it is. And then maybe you'll get as angry as I am that it's not taught in our regular formal education to the kids when they're little. So again, our aura sits outside of our body. It's our energy field. Think of it this way. When you walk into a room, before you're, you step over a threshold, your aura, your energy has already entered that room. Your aura is all sensory. It's completely sensory related. That's what it does. It picks up the temperature of the environment, the sensory information about the, how things smell, how they feel, that stifling. They, it picks up all the sensory stuff feeds to the brain. 
And if you listen to your aura, it's telling the brain, I don't like it here. Oh, this is comfortable. That person makes me feel funny. Oh, she's very nice. This is what the brain tells her, or this is good for me, or um, this is not good. I should get away from that. If you listen, but we're not used to listening. We were born as human beings and most animals were born with two things that we don't use hardly anymore or recognize anymore, but our way, way, way back ancestors did. One is our aura that would keep us from danger. Our ancestors used it all the time to sense their environment, to sense the wilderness, to sense if smell or if feed, to see if food was good or if it was toxic, to see if the land was fertile. We don't, what do we do? If we wanna know if something's good that's around us or whatever, if we wanna know what the temperature is gonna be, we check the weather. If we wanna know if some fruit is good or a piece of meat is good, we look at the expiration date. You know, if we wanna know about something, we Google something. They didn't, they used what we were given as a sensory way to understand how we work, sense how we're feeling, how overall our health is doing and the environment around us. The second thing we were given is this little gland. It's in the center of the brain. It's called the pineal gland or pineal gland. If I have any medical people out there, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's also called the third eye. There's a reason it's called the third eye. It's placed in the perfect part of the brain that picks up all the electrical transmissions deciphers everything and tells the brain what it is that we're feeling, how something's affecting our body, how it's affecting the space around us. We still have those. We don't use it. Our brain tries to use it, but we ignore the stuff because we were trained to. And again, hopefully after tonight, you won't. So that is your aura itself. It's not this wonderful, I hear people say, oh, it's this wonderful spiritual. It's, it's not. It's an energy field that comes off of your body from the work that your body does. It creates this field, this energy field. Now I'm going to turn on the PowerPoint and my assistant Peggy is going to tell me if she can, if everybody can see it, because sometimes it likes to do its own thing. Let me see, Peggy, you let me know. It's there. It just needs to be bigger. Okay. Okay. Whoopsie. There you go. You see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's, that's me when I was in my twenties. Ah, no, I'm not. Um, as you can tell, you're going to be able to see, I don't draw well. Okay. So we've talked about the aura, the field, the energy field inside that energy field is color and everyone has a color and the color tells a lot about you. So what I have here is I did not make this. I actually took this. It's called an energy spectrum. It has only to do with your energy, your sensory energy. It's all about your senses. That's what your aura is for. That's what it's completely for. It does nothing but sense things around you and protect you. So keep that thought in your head. So there is an energy spectrum and the energy spectrum goes from people who have the least amount of by birth, by biology, sensory awareness to people who have the highest amount. And of course, it's DNA related. So I put spiritual on one end. But you can't leave our loved ones out there. They're still energy. They're still in their energy form. So you can't leave them out. And then you have earth tone and life colors. But first, you have to understand what the color is. And this is very important. Your color is made up of your biological wastes your perspiration, your cellular division, your respiration, your excretion, your sweating. Everything that you do comes off of your body. Think of it like sweat. And it gets trapped in this energy field. Not trapped is a bad thing, but it comes off your body and there it is. These are all made up of your biological enzymes, your biological waste products. So because it's your biological enzymes, your pancreatic juices, your gastric juices, your liver enzymes, all those things, it is biologically you. So the colors that come off are you. They are extremely detailed to you. They're different than anybody else's and they're just as accurate as a thumbprint. So yes, you could be blue and somebody else can be blue, but nobody's going to be the same blue as somebody else. It is genetic. So obviously in your family, you could have several people who are blues or greens or yellows or pinks. Um, and so that's not uncommon. 
but your aura color is unique to you. You do not lose your aura color. You have it all your life. You're not a blue one day and halfway through your life, you turn to an orange. It doesn't happen. But that is what your color is. So your color tells you two things. The color tells the person who's looking at it. Number one, if they have any increased biological sensory awareness, and if so, what kind is it? It also tells the person who's looking at them what is wrong with them, where their problem areas are. So let me explain the spectrum first, then I'll go into that part. So going back to the grid, your loved ones have to be on that grid because they do have energy, but they are absence of color. Now, why are they absent of color? Now, I just told you where the color comes from. They don't digest anymore. They don't perspire anymore. They don't exhale anymore. So therefore, they do not have a color to their aura, but they still have an aura, i.e. energy field. Going up the grid to more sensory ability would be earth tones. And those are your browns and your greens and your yellows and your oranges and your pinks, uh, yellows, if I didn't say that already. But it's easier to do it this way. The highest amount of sensory awareness by birth, by biology are life colors. And there's only two. There's blue and violet. If you're not a blue, you're not a violet, then you're an earth tone. And it's just easier to do it that way. So I always talk about the life colors first because there is, there's only two. So these people, blues and violets, have the highest amount of by birth sensory awareness. All that means is that they are like born to sense things more so than other people in different ways. It doesn't mean the earth tones can't, they absolutely can. It just means they need to work just a little bit harder at it. It doesn't come so natural to them. So blues are empath. I'm sure you've heard of empathetics before. They are more gut intuitive. My assistant Peggy is a blue. They get their sensory information about what's going on around them and it mostly hits them in the gut. It's the feeling that they get. They just know something's wrong or that person's just not right or that they just know the phone's gonna ring or they just know something bad's gonna happen. They can't explain why they don't even know where it's coming from, but they just know. That is a blue. Now, blues are uh, Mother Earth's favorite child. What that means is that anything that benefits Mother Earth benefits them and vice versa. They get their healing and their energy from being close and connected. They also have very close traits to that. Every aura color has colors and traits that are characteristic to them and to their personality. So a blue is everyone's friend. A blue is um, the best friend, the confidant. They are very giving people. They will continue to give even though they've been taken advantage of. They are just nice people. They are usually, but not always, in professions that are helping professions, such as nurses and doctors and teachers and social workers and librarians and anything in the helping field. You will usually find them anywhere where they're helping people do something. So when I do private aura consultations, I always tell the color of the person and I tell them what their good qualities are or what the good things of that color is and what the bad things, because, you know, that just is hand in hand. Blues are the only ones I have to tell them that the bad things about being a blue are the good things. And it's a shame because they are taken advantage of terribly. People just expect them to always be there to always help, to always fix everything, to put their own needs aside. It's very sad to watch because they will continue to do so. So that's a blue. A violet is an increase in biological sensory awareness in the actual senses, hearing, seeing, smelling, and feeling. I am a violet, hence my ability to hear, see, smell, feel. Our loved ones, your loved ones, everybody's loved ones, puppies, okay? So again, and my pop-up had it, and my father had it, and it's an, it is biological. Does it miss some people? Sure, but neither of my brothers have it. It's not everybody, uh, but it is definitely biological. So violets are the universe's favorite friend. Remember I said blues were Mother Earth's? So violets are a little bit different than blues. You'll also find them in the helping field. But violets and blues, you can't have the color blue without violet and violet without blue. So for some period of time, they run down the same road and they have a lot of the same characteristics and traits and then they go their own way. 
So violets, as I am, have a tendency to come off as being a little arrogant. And we're actually not arrogant. We're actually very kind and sweet and helpful. The problem is where it's like we're over everybody looking down. It's like we're up in the air and looking down. We already know the resolution of something. We already know how the story is going to end. We already know the outcome. And we can see things that other people can't see. It's like we have vivid vision and we sometimes walk around like, why didn't you know that? You couldn't tell that was going to happen. And almost like, oh, again, almost like we're being a little arrogant. Um, where blues and, and violets trade off is, I'll take Peggy for example. You know, Peggy, if she finally gets to the point of saying no to somebody, which is very hard for blues to say no and turn somebody down, Peggy will be like, geez, I wish I hadn't said, did I, should I said no? Maybe I shouldn't have said no to him. Geez, I hope I didn't hurt their feelings. Maybe I should stop what I'm doing and go help them. Should I call them and see if they're okay? This is a blue. And then there's me. If I get to the point where I have to ha absolutely have to say no, I'm okay with that. And I don't have a problem with it. And I don't care if they're angry. And I don't care if they're upset. And I don't care. But the blues do. So there's the difference. So blues and violets are on the spectrum of the highest amount of biological, by birth, sensory awareness. Doesn't make us better than anybody else. It's just that's how it works. Earth tone colors, which we'll talk about shortly, they can do the same thing. It just it doesn't come as easy to them. But once they learn to know what they're looking for, how to see auras, how to sense their auras, they're they're fine. They're never quite going to be up to you know how easy it is for blues and, and violets, but they'll, they'll you know they'll get a lot better. So now that's what, so I said, the color tells you two things. Number one, if you have any increased sensory awareness, if so, are you a blue or a violet? Um, it also tells you if you're a, a different, if you're an earth tone color, what kind of traits and characteristics you might be looking at. So you can either avoid that person like the plague, um, but it also tells you how you're feeling. So when I look at people and I look at their colors, I can see if they're not doing well health-wise. I can see where they have gut problems or I can see where they have cancers or I can see where they have joint problems or anxiety or depression. Again, your color does not change. But if I'm looking at say Janet and Janet's got a bad headache, her color is gonna be there. It's just in that area, it's gonna look a little wispy or a little drawn or a lot, not late moving. Energy, like I said, moves constantly. It doesn't stop. But when we get ill and we get sick, if we're in bad situations all the time, people, situations, jobs, spouses, work, living places, after a while, it's like a, it doesn't flow very well and it gets stagnant. It's like a cog in a wheel where it's just trying to move. And that's when we get sick and that's when we get ill and that's when things happen to us. So again, if I was looking at Janet and Janet had a headache, this area would just look like it's not moving. If she had something else horrible going on or something else like it's constantly having a problem to it, like say she had Crohn's disease or something or a thyroid problem, by this time, by her age, I'm not saying she's old, I'm just saying she's been around more than 20 years, it could get to the point where it also almost looks like there's no color where somebody took a fist and punched it right through. So it's absent of color. That means there's no flow going on there at all. That means there's damage in that part of the body and we need to fix it, okay? So that's what your color tells you. Your placement tells me something else. There's four kinds of placement. Everybody, I don't care if you're an earth tone color or life color, you, it's only four. And those tell you something completely different. That tells me or you where this increased sensory awareness is coming at you all day long, sight unseen. Doesn't really matter what you're doing. It's coming even when you're sleeping what part of the body is hitting you or is getting impacted by it. And that also tells us a lot about where you might be prone to diseases and, and certain disorders. So you got the hole, which is on the top below that segmented over to the bottom is the cardiac. And the one above is called the lunatic. It's actually the cranial placement, but they call themselves lunatics. I don't. So very quickly, the hole, I'm a hole. What that means is everything that's going on, sight unseen, morning, noon, and night since the day I was born, weekends, holidays, when I'm sleeping, is pretty much hitting my whole body. It's, I'm not being bombarded in one particular part of my body. My whole body is getting hit. So that's good. You don't want to be like hit in one spot. The problem is there's no outlets. So the stuff comes in, it 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 comes in. Oh, my Lord, it's going to come in. There's no outlets. 
for it. So when I don't do the right things and my body starts to feel this, my aura starts to feel it, I start to get migraines and then I can't sleep and then I get anxiety and I get heart palpitations and I start profusely sweating and my pulse goes up. So, you know, I have to learn, I've learned, and thank goodness I have the background I do, how to keep myself from letting what needs to come off, come off. Now, these people who are um, earth tone, I mean, excuse me, that who are whole, as I said, you know, it's good they're not being bombarded in one place. The problem is their whole body's being attacked. So you would expect to see things like autoimmune diseases. I have lupus, affects the whole body. Uh, you would absolutely expect to see anxiety and depression because their brain, which is deciphering all this, is constantly being bombarded. In these types of people, you um, are very highly to see, especially if you're female, female cancers like breast cancer, uterine cancer, um, cervical cancer. So you got to be careful of that. And some gut issues like GERD and colitis and things like that. So the person below is segmented, has a lot of the same characteristics as the whole, but you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, but look, Sydney, they, they, got, they got the breaks. Yes, they do. So they are fortunate. Their whole body is getting impacted, but they have the breaks to let this stuff off. The problem is, is that when this sensory information comes into their body, as it comes in, it goes right back out. So they're very scattered. And this scattered follows them around in every aspect of their life. They don't want to take like head positions places. They feel like they have like 20 projects going and none of them are completed. They don't want to make decisions because they don't feel like they have all the information that they need. And that's because all the stuff that's just supposed to be there to help them understand what's going around them, their body to understand the full equation, as soon as it comes in, it's gone. Now, they can very easily learn to hold that information closer to them, the one stuff that they want without getting in trouble, but they do have to learn to work on it. Um, the only difference with the scattered person is they also have the autoimmune problems but, you know, yeah, blood cancers, you have to watch out for blood cancers, also anxiety and depression, migraines, unbelievable migraines, and sleep, sleep issues with scattered people. Um, they don't do well in relationships, and a lot of times they have several divorces because they just don't seem to fit in with different people because they don't feel like they're all there. The next person on the bottom is cardiac, and it's, I should draw the picture better. It is considered the cardiac placement, but it actually takes place from the throat, if you know anything about chakras, down to right above the belly button. So that encompasses quite a large area. If you notice that person's also a whole, there's no breaks, it's no different than the other one. They're just getting bombarded in this, those, that one area, constantly, morning, noon, and night, since the day they were born, constantly, constantly, constantly. And they don't have any breaks either. So Peggy is, this placement, the cardiac placement. So let me explain something. You can be blue and be an empath and you can have this placement and be an earth tone color. This is the placement for an empath. So even if you're green or an orange, if you have this placement, you're still considered to some degree an empath. But if you are blue and you have this placement, like Peggy, Peggy you are like the epitome. It's kind of sad to see. Peggy's a wonderful person, but she's, um, she, she goes through you know, a lot. And she handles it like really, really well. Um, but these people take a beat in, and it's just especially in the heart and lungs area, in the throat area, high instances of thyroid cancer or uh, adrenal problems, a thymus or thalamic pro problems, um, bronchitis, pneumonia, COPD, CHF. Uh, is problems with the spleen, problems with the liver, the gallbladder, gallbladder is always hit. Stomach problems like GERD um, and you know, malabsorption problems, even to the point of Crohn's or celiac disease, um, they get hit really, really hard. And again, the, the two biggest cancers with them are thyroid and like a pancreas kind of problem. So again, knowing this stuff is extremely important so you can stay ahead of the game, right? Okay, and again, this isn't new. They've known this. So the last one is actually the cranial placement. They call themselves a lunatic because what I want you to understand is that everything that comes in our, our, our body, no matter where it's going to hit our body, has to be deciphered. Remember I told you the pineal gland and the aura has to be deciphered in the brain for us to make the best decision. This person's brain from the time they're born is bombarded in one place. Boom, 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 morning, noon, night, weekends, holidays. These poor people can't get out of their own way. 
they know something's wrong with them. They don't fit in. They don't feel like they belong here. They'll say to me, I don't belong here. I, I don't know where I belong, but I don't belong here. They are very sad. You talk about depression, ugh, depression ain't even the word for it. Low self-esteem, forget it. There's just none whatsoever. Forget about low. And they want help. They know there's something wrong with them. They want help desperately. And they will go to doctors and what's going to happen? And, you know, I'm in the medical field. They give them an antipsychotic. It's got to be up here. Yeah, crazy. If you give somebody who's got this type of aura placement an antipsychotic, it doesn't work. And it also can make it worse. Antipsychotics work on the chemicals in your brain. This has nothing to do with that. This has, it's a place, this is your aura. And so it actually makes them worse. So when that fails and they don't get any relief from it, they give up and they start doing things to harm themselves. And so it's high instance of alcoholism and chemical dependency and you know, substance abuse, they start cutting, cutting is huge and ultimately suicide. It's sad, it's very, very sad. All because people, especially the medical community aren't trying, even trying to understand that there could be alternate things going on with people. Now, if I see a child that has this aura placement, I don't care if I don't know them or not, I will always go up to the parents and start the conversation. Because if I can get to a child, and, and nine times out of 10, the parents are grateful because they know something's wrong with their child. They want help, so they'll listen. And I've helped a lot of kids. Well, I haven't, just knowledge has helped a lot of kids. An adult, it's kind of hard because unless you get to them, you know, in enough of a time or depending on when and what part in their aging process they are, it can backfire on you. So you got to be really careful, but I always try to help. So every one of you have one of these placements, every one of you. Um, so it's not hard. Once I tell people about what the different you know, traits and things that you find, most people say, oh, shoot, that's me. So it's not hard to figure out what you are. You cannot see your own aura. You cannot look in the mirror and you cannot capture it on photos. So I just want to let you know that. So this is the four auras, uh, the four types of placements. Again, the color tells you if you have any increased sensory ability, if so, what kind, and how, over, how you're doing overall, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, where you have a ailments. The placement tells you what part of your body is being affected the most by outside influences. That could be people or situations or even your own body. So picture it this way. So you're standing in an elevator and you're in the middle and people get on the elevator and there's four, four or five people total. So two to the front of you, two to the back of you, and you're in the middle, kind of like a five on a dice. Nobody's saying a word, but the person to your front right just found out they're losing their job. The person to the back left just found out their husband's leaving them. The first, the person to your left and the, excuse me, in the right, in the back, just lost their mother. And the person up front is just um, found out that their girlfriend's calling off the marriage. Nobody has to say a word, but all that negative stuff that's coming off of them, all their grief, all their hostility is coming off of them. That's what it does. And ours does too. It's like a ping pong back and forth in this little tiny cubicle and your body's taking this stuff on and your body's absorbing it, and it is changing your body. You're giving off stuffs too. So again, remember what I told you about energy, there's a give and take. We give off, somebody else is effective and, and vice versa. So you've gotta be able to understand and listen to your body to know what situations are good for you, how to protect yourself, what places or parts of your body you need to protect the most. And when I told you before that these, these, this, this is not a new study, Understanding um, your aura, how it affects your body, what diseases you're prone to, what's good for you, what you should stay away from, what type of people are best for you, what types of jobs and situations and which ones you should run from. If we had this, if we were taught this at a very early age, how much better off would all of us be doing right now? How well would the medical industry be doing or the pharmaceutical industry? or the insurance industry, think about it. We are taught in school about chemical energy, electrical energy, kinetic energy. Why aren't we taught about biological energy? And right away people say, oh no, Sydney, we are. No, we are not. We are taught about our neurons and their firing and cellular division. That is not 
your essence. That is not the inside of you, the, what really makes you tick. That is your life source. The other things are processes. Why aren't we taught about our life force that is so detailed for us? Why weren't we taught that in school? I'll let you ponder that one. I already have my own opinion, but that's okay. So let me explain how you're going to correct all this stuff with you now. This is a brain before Peggy redid it for me. It used to look like a broccoli. So I'm so glad she did it over for me. This is not a science test. And for those of you again with a medical background, you'll understand probably where I'm going with this. But what I do want you to understand is you have uh, several parts of your brain. Now your brain does many, many things, but we're only talking tonight about what has to do with auras or energy. So you have the frontal lobe, you have the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. You need all them functioning very, very well in order to do what you were given to be able to understand what's going around you, what your aura is trying to tell you, what your pineal gland is trying to tell you. You need your brain functioning pretty well. So your frontal lobe, where it comes to the topic we're talking tonight, is for higher thinking, higher awareness, understanding what's going on around us, being able to decipher us and make the best decision. The parietal lobe is really responsible for vision and touch. I don't have touch in there, I apologize. So you want that functioning really well. Number one, to see auras, but also to see your loved ones who have passed and the touch so you can feel your loved ones because all it is, is their energy, their aura, touching your energy, your aura. That is all it is. It's very simple. You can feel them. You just have to know what it is they feel like. You, the problem is, is you're not taught what they really smell like, what they sound like. It's not what you think, what they feel like. It is absolutely not what you think. So if you don't know what to look for, how are you ever going to have an experience with them? And then the information is out there. Like I said, go to your local library. Anyway, so the temporal lobe, smelling and hearing. All right, you want them working really well. At not so much for auras, has nothing to do with auras, but to smell and hear your loved ones. And the occipital lobe for depth, you want that working really well because when you see your loved ones, they sometimes look 3D, their energy, their aura. And when you see auras, they look 3D. So the problem is, is that our brain is not functioning well. It has not functioned well in decades. And I'm gonna explain to you why. We are overwhelmed, over bombarded with things vying for our attention. Story I usually tell with this so people understand is for those of you who remember the Andy Griffith show, for some of you who are young, you may want to watch it, but the Andy Griffith show was pretty representative of what my life was like in the 60s. So just to here's the analogy so you know how this whole thing works. So back when I was younger, if you wanted to have things for Sunday dinner, you had to go to the grocery store on Saturday. If you wanted gas, you had to go on Saturday. Everything was closed on Sunday. On Sunday was a day of family, faith, food, and rest. That was it. And that's what the Andy Griffith show. So here we go. So you have Andy on the front porch, Sunday, strumming his guitar, Barney whittling away on a stick, Aunt B cooking Sunday dinner. Everything is <sighs> namaste. Everything's nice and relaxed. What's going on in the brain? Your dopamine and your serotonin, two neurotransmitters that sit near that little brown, that's the pineal gland in the center of the brain that I drew. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, nice and even, nice and relaxed and, right? That is your parasympathetic mode. That is your nice and relaxed, then all of a sudden, stupid Opie goes running out, chasing his ball into the road and Goober's coming down the road in his truck. And he jumps up, he drops his guitar, his pulse goes up, his pupils constrict, he starts sweating like a pig and he's hauling butt to get to his son before the truck hits him. He switches into the sympathetic nervous system or your fight or flight. You might've heard that before. Instead of dopamine and, and serotonin, your brain is pushing out ephedrine and adrenaline. So it gives you that rush. He gets to his son just in the nick of time, pulls him out from the front of the truck. He recoils. The brain pushes massive amounts of dopamine, which is why people, when they get over something like this, they're like, oh, whew. right? It's starting to calm down. 
your pupils go back to normal, your pulse comes down, your blood pressure comes down, you stop sweating. You go back into the parasympathetic mode and you are namaste. That is how our brain is supposed to work. In the parasympathetic mode, most of the time with a situational sympathetic surge. That's not how we live, folks. And at least for three generations, that's not how we've lived. We live in the sympathetic mode all the time. Ephedrine and adrenaline are toxic and irritating to the brain. But in small doses, every once in a while, situationally, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Your body absorbs it. Serotonin brushes it out. You're good. But you can't have it living there all the time. And between politics and religion and families and death of a parent or taking care of a, bed, a parent or a child or divorce or taxes or anything else, we are a hot mess in our brains. And it's not good. And we're the only ones that can fix it. You know, they did a study in the 1950s. And what they meant to do when these scientists is they have been putting into big businesses fluorescent overhead lights. So they wanted to see how well it increased the productivity of their employees. And what they found out was not what they thought. As a matter of fact, it took them in a whole different direction. Not only were these fluorescent light bulbs overhead decreasing productivity, but it was also wearing on the brain and increasing the amount of ephedrine that was pushed out into the brain. More, less productive and less ability to be able to function like the brain's supposed to. So that was in the 50s when they did this study. So how long ago was that? That was a while ago, right? But our ancestors way back had no problem using this. They didn't have all the stuff, the TVs and the news and the newspapers and the Google and the Yahoo and everything else. They didn't have all that stuff. They had the basics. So I'm gonna say two things about this and then I'm gonna to explain to you how you can get yourself better and talk to you about the other colors. So, Go to your library. As a matter of fact, Janet, I always ask the libraries, um, do you have in your library, do you keep any journals from maybe the town you lived in, people, maybe settlers in your town and they wrote journals? Do you keep any of those there or is it the Historical Society? I I don't know. I'm not a librarian. But oh, I, sorry. I, I still could know, uh, but I, I don't happen to know the answer to that question. Okay, I was just asked because... Uh, you know, a long time ago, back in the, especially late 17, early, early 1800s, our ancestors journaled like crazy, especially men. It's kind of like a diary. And, you know, if you read these journals, it's kind of monotonous. It's like, why did they write this? i give you an example. It would be something, because I've read so many of them. It'd be something like this. Oh, I'm going to go down to Swamp's Pond today. and I'm going to use my new reel. I hope, you know, I spent some good money on this and caught, cost me two cows and, uh, I'm going to go down there and catch some bass. And next thing you know, he's like, well, I'm down here and use the fishing pole. It's a beautiful day here. Nobody else is here. It's nice and quiet. The water seems nice and calm. Mom's here in her nice, pretty pink dress. I was like when she wore that. And oops, I cost a 10 pound bass. Whee! I mean, and you're like, so what? So what? Well, if you continue to read these things over and over again, mom wasn't there. Mom in her pretty pink dress, that was mom's energy. Mom was there. He didn't say the ghost of mom was there. You find out later, mom's dead. And it was just part of the story. It wasn't, and the glorious vision of my mother presented to, no, my mom was there to pay, pay and on to the fish. And when you read enough of these things, you realize that our ancestors had these experiences all the time, all the time. And it was normal and natural. So they just wrote it as part of the story. It wasn't that big of a deal. The other place where you can get evidence besides science books, because people bring this up all the time, anybody who's well-versed or otherwise in the Bible, you know, the Bible does tell us that we're not supposed to see energies, auras, spirits, whatever you want to call them, because it's the devil's work. Okay, it, it does say that, it does. But it also says a couple of other things that people sometimes forget about. There's four parables, parables are stories in the Bible. And in four, all four of these stories, they talk about a loved one coming, an energy, of their loved one coming for celebration, to bring a message, to provide comfort. And nowhere in the story is the next line, and they screamed, it's a ghost, and they ran. No. The next line is, and they rejoiced, and they were exhilarated, and they celebrated. Doesn't sound like somebody who saw a ghost to me, does that? Doesn't sound like somebody who saw a ghost to you? The reason why these, these novels, excuse me, these um, 
journals and the Bible and other writings talk about it in such plain language, like no big deal. It's because it happened all the time. It was expected and it was accepted. It was expected because it happened all the time and it was accepted because it happened all the time. How did we go from that to where we are today? They used to be able to, our ancestors sense everything. If they wanted to know if somebody was coming to their village, they put their ear down the ground to listen for the horse hoofs. If they wanted to know if uh, something if in the forest was edible, they'd have to have a keen sense of smell to be able to know if something was toxic or good to eat. We look at, like I said, expiration labels. If they wanted to know how to build something or do it, it was trial and error. They had nothing to go by. We Google something or watch a YouTube video. We're not using this like them. And it's also our lifestyle, unfortunately, has put us in a very bad place. So we got to get to the children so this doesn't happen to them. And that's why Peggy and I work very, very hard at trying to get people to understand about auras. So how do you fix yourself? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this. Oops, excuse me. Switch to the next one. I think Peggy in the uh, chat box put my uh, email. If anybody has any questions, Sydney Sherman author at yahoo.com and my website, sydneyshermanauthor.com. So I'm going to take this down because I don't think we need this if Peggy put it in the chat. Okay. What helps you clean up your brain is dopamine. What helps you unclear the mess <laughs> that your brain is right now is dopamine. And I'm not talking about a pill. I'm not talking about a pill. I'm not. And it's just a wonderful thing the way it works. You have to be able to sense what's going on in your body and you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to sense the people around you. The, is it a good situation? Is it a bad situation? Until you clean this up. It doesn't take long. As I tell people all the time, ladies, you know it might take you a half a year to lose 20 pounds, right? And like three days to put it all back on. It's not that way with auras. This is a lifetime of mess. But within a couple of weeks, you can clean it up pretty good. And it's a very simple thing. It's easy to do. So nobody has any excuses not to do it. Everything is either free, cheap, or easy. I don't know how to make it better for you. It's all about dopamine. What you want to do is you have to do two things. You have to know how to promote the dopamine flow and you have to know when to let things go. You have to know that as soon as you get, eh, as soon as somebody says you or their personality or something they do makes you want, eh, as soon as you, you're excreting ephedrine, stop that, stop that, let it go. Unless sometimes you have to step forward and you have to take care of it. You're going to have to learn to, to chill. Stop that ephedrine from being excreted constantly. It's tough but you can do it. So one of the first things that you need to do is to breathe properly. We don't breathe properly. Dopamine is frees, uh, free flows very easily when we breathe. So most of us don't breathe the correct way. I'm going to show you very quickly. Shoulders are relaxed. You breathe in through four, five, six, 10, whatever you can do through your nose. Hold it for like two seconds, like a roller coaster, and your exhale should be longer than your inhale. You do that for a minute, minute and a half. First time you do, second time, third time, you're gonna be holding on something saying, whoo, I'm dizzy. <laughs> yeah, you are because your brain is saying, what is this? I don't recognize you. It's oxygen. It's used to having retained CO2, which again, does not help the situation. And after a while, your brain gets used to it. Don't hurt yourself. You're lightly expanding your lungs. You're not uh, doing that. Nice and relaxed, holding it for a second or two. and letting it all go. That dumps a whole bunch of dopamine. Scientists say that if you do that for five minutes a day, that you're dumping dopamine for about six or seven hours. I'm sorry, I'm not a, sci I'm not a scientist, they're probably right, but I'm telling you from what I know, you'll probably get a good four hours out of it, but still that's great. Imagine going on about your business and you're dumping this wonderful dopamine, fixing yourself, fixing your body, and you don't even have to do anything. The second thing is music. If anybody's ever gone and had a massage or does yoga or ever had Reiki, um, it's called it's music that they play. It's very nice music. But the main thing about it is it's 444 hertz. Now, how do you identify that? Well, first of all, if it's a yoga, Reiki or some tape like that, it probably is. But what 444 hertz is, if you've ever heard the song, Alleluia, G, uh, David played a chord that pleased the Lord. It really is not a chord. It's a frequency. It's a vibration. It's the reason why monks go, 
Aum. Before they get into meditation, it's a vibration of frequency that hits that pineal gland and dumps the dopamine so that they can meditate. So it's as simple as that. So if you're listening to one of those songs, next time you listen to a Reiki song or a yoga song, which doesn't usually have words to it, it's just music. It sounds like there's a note. It's not a note. It sounds like there's a note being held through the whole song. You can hear a song playing around it, okay? But that's what it does. That's 444 hertz. So you can put it on. You can be washing dishes, you can be sitting relaxed, you can do a crochet, you can do a crossword puzzle. As long as your brain, your ears hearing it saying to your brain, you are dumping dopamine. Put it in your car, listen to it. Put it on before you go to bed, fall asleep to it. It's a wonderful thing. Salt lamp. I don't know if you can see behind me. I'm going to move out of the way. Let me see if I can do this. Whoopsie. Do you see my little salt lamp over there on the table? This is my Reiki room, so that's why it looks like this. Um, salt lamps, I have one in every room in my house, except for the bathroom. Uh, salt lamps are very simple. They're cheap. They're easy. You plug them in. You're not going to burn your house down. You know, my salt lamps stand all the time and I can go put my hand on them and they're slightly warm. Salt lamps, what happens is the salt melts and yes, they're not broken. Put a little plate under it. It's fine. When they heat up, the salt releases negative ions in the air. And I know your first thought is, I don't want negative. No, this is fine. You do. It breaks up all the stagnation that's going on around you all the time. You don't even realize it. Just from the process of you living, there's negative stuff that's just left up there. Arguments, ailments, uh, being upset, depression, sadness, crying. It's just all left in there hanging and it breaks up. It's like a nice little roto rooter. Cleans the air for you. You set it and you forget it. You turn it on and leave it alone. So salt lamps are great. Um, stones. As a matter of fact, I have a another program that Peggy and I are gonna be doing on stones, but they're just the chakra stones. If any of you know about Reiki or had done, I'm sure you heard about chakras. It's called sometimes a stone's not just a stone and it's not. So I just happen to have this evening three stones with me and I like stones in the raw. You can get them polished, they're fine, but this is a jade. It's kind of pretty, huh? And this is just a clear quartz. I don't know if you can see it. And this right here is a yellow jasper. Okay, so if you have a stone, some stones work really well with certain colors. Um, some stones are good for everybody. Nobody needs a black stone. Everybody is on this big kick. They all have to have hematite. No, just don't. <laughs> just live it along. But stones are very good. And this is how it worked. Like I tell you, I used to poo-poo stones when people talked about it until I, I went through the process. And I thought, how does this work? And this is how it works. Certain stones, not pebbles, that you see like in the, in the sand. They work with our natural chemistry. Certain stones have mineral contents like phosphorus and nitrates and, and salts and stuff like that that work very well with our enzymes. As a matter of fact, what I usually say in the beginning of this presentation, I forgot, is for all the people that did not believe that we were from the universe in the last 20 years with the help of people like uh, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, they have actually found that a lot of the chemicals that we have, a lot of the enzymes and the mineral contents that we have in our body mimic exactly what they, you find in the stars and the planets and the solar systems. So we are linked. We absolutely are. So there you go. But the same thing with stone. So you can take a large stone. You cut a piece of the stone off. It doesn't lose its magnetic property. Stones are magnetic because they're attached to the earth and the earth is magnetic. So it works well. So you take the stone. And I'm just going to use my um, yellow jasper right here. And you can use it for many things. You can use it for many different things. But what technically all I really want people to know is you put it in your hand, never choke the stone, you know, or close. You want the energy to flow. Watching TV, you just hold it in your hand. You can do this, talking on the phone. You can do this. You can keep it in your pants pocket if you want. You can put it on the bedside table next to you when you're sleeping. That's fine. But here's how it works. Anytime you put anything on a thin area of skin, and again, I'm talking about your palm right now, it causes it to sweat. Now, it's not sweat that you're going to notice, but it does cause sweating because of the pressure. When that causes the sweating and the little pores open up, it also causes a vasodilation and little venules that sit under the skin and in the capillaries and the little arterioles, and they vasodilate, which causes a flush of blood. 
when you have that flush of blood, you dump the dopamine. So just by keeping the stone on your hand, number one, it does that. But number two, if you get the right stone and the stone mixes well with your aura color, like if you're a blue, um, you do very well with jaspers and rubies and garnets and um, yellow citrines. If you are a violet, basically the same, but the moss agate is awesome. If you are a yellow or, or whatever, ju um, jade or ruby is your best bet. Sapphires eh, really go so much for pinks. It all depends. But some stones are good for everybody. So what I tell people all the time is if you want to get a stone, if you don't know your aura color, if you get a citrine, you get a jade, or you get a ruby, or some kind of an agate, you're fine. Those are those are good go-to stones for everybody. But the mineral content in the stone mixes with the sweat mineral content. And it causes, like I said, the vasodilation. And what it feels like, so if you ever had an IV for the first time, and you can feel the fluid start to go in and then it kind of like goes away. That's what it feels like the first time you hold it. It's like this rush. So those are stones. Sage. Sage, I, I like white sage. Peggy and I don't sell any product or anything like that. But Peggy and I like white sage for many reasons. And I don't like the stuff that comes in the little, little you know, dish. And I don't like the bulky stuff because it stinks. I don't like that. You got to watch out for like frankincense and um, lemongrass because if you have pets, it can cause seizures. Also, we like to use the sticks. The sticks are great. Again, light it, put the little plate underneath it, set it and forget it. You can be washing dishes, vacuuming, as long as your nose is smelling it, it's dumping the dopamine. The reason why we like the white sage is because, especially this particular brand, got to be careful when you're buying it because a lot of times to make these last longer, whatever fragrance it is, they soak them in formaldehyde. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be breathing this formaldehyde when I'm trying to dump my dopamine. So white sage is very good. But what they found is whatever fragrance you like the best, whatever fragrance relaxes you, I don't care if it's jasmine or whatever it is, if you really just, when you smell it, it's just so nice, then that's the fragrance for you to dump the dopamine. When scientists did an experiment, because you know me, I have to know about experiments, um, oh, 30 years ago, and they were testing people's nose and how it affects their brain and, and stuff like that. They found that there was a small percentage of people that really dumped a lot of dopamine, the smell of their own feces. I mean, to each his own, but have at it. So that's that. Meditation. Now, most people don't know how to meditate properly. If you do, good for you. But you can still dump a whole bunch of dopamine if you just meditate the way most people can. Blues and violets cannot meditate. Our brains do not shut off. It's not going to happen. So this is how a normal person meditates. Here we go. I'm nice and relaxed. I got my music on. I got my salt lamp going on. My sage is burning. The music is playing. There you go. I think the dog has an appointment this afternoon. Oh, see, now shoot, I can't. I can't. And then you get upset. And what Sydney tells you happens when you get upset? You dump ephedrine. No, 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 no guilt. No guilt. This is the right way to do it. Everything's going. I think the dog's got an appointment this afternoon. Well, I'll have to check when I'm done. Acknowledge it, put it up on a shelf, and go back. When's my appointment for the dentist? Friday? I don't know, is this Friday or next Friday? I'll have to look. Acknowledge it, put it up on a shelf. No guilt. You're still getting a good meditation in. You're still dumping that dopamine. Let it go. Just acknowledge the items and put them up on the shelf. So that's how to properly meditate. Dumping a lot of dopamine. Reiki yoga is wonderful. Peggy and I are Reiki masters. So we teach Reiki. We give Reiki, not so much with COVID. Um, distance Reiki, I give tons of distance Reiki all the time. It's, it works out wonderful. But if anybody's ever had Reiki, basically that's using universal light or energy to help heal and flush out that which is no not good for you using your own energy as well so reiki is a wonderful thing and yoga anytime you spend time working on your body or expelling energy you're actually doing the same thing with dopamine so all of those things that i said the breathing the music the salt lamps the stones the sage the meditation the reiki those are all things that every one of them you can do you know these stones you can get them at a stone store and they're like three bucks 
You can get them on Amazon, three bucks. They're not expensive. The, you know, the CDs, you can download them free. You can take them off of uh, Amazon or YouTube and just play them. It, this doesn't cost a lot of money, but it is so well worth it. Let me tell you how well worth it is for you. Most of the time what people do is they come to me about two weeks after they start the process. They're like, Sydney, I just, I feel like things smell clearer. They just, it's like, I can smell all this stuff. Everything just seems like really clear. I'm like, that's great. And then another week goes by and they're like, you know, I stepped on the scale this morning, Sydney, because I could have sworn I lost 20 pounds. And I didn't, darn it. But I just feel so lighter. I just feel like I move better. And that's what you're going to start to see. And you're going to feel it. It doesn't take that long. Got to put the time in, folks. I'm sorry, I can't do it for you. But with this sense of yourself, you do start to learn to feel your body, what your body is trying to tell you, how to use the sensory aura awareness that you were given in the pineal gland, let it work after you clear your brain out doing this stuff. And you're going to learn how to understand when you walk into a room to listen to your gut when it's saying, you know what, it's not going to feel right here and go. Even if you can't figure out what it is it's telling you to do that, just listen and go. Same thing with avoiding people. So let's talk about some people here. It's very to end before Peggy talks about the pets quickly. So I talk about, you know, a lot of aura colors, but the earth tones, I know you're waiting to hear about them. There's four in particular, because the rest of them are you know, too bad. You must avoid at all costs. Remember what I said to you before, anything or any person or situation that makes you go, <clears throat> you're dumping the ephedrine, so avoid. The first one's a green. Think money hungry. They are, they only love themselves. They don't love anybody else. They are misogynistic. They are manipulative. They are, um, uh, they are liars. They're cheats. They're scoundrels. They'll do anything they can to benefit themselves. In the beginning, they may come off as charming, um, but they very quickly change. They just want what they can get from you. They don't care about the carnage they leave in, in their wake. They are absolutely uh, the worst people on the face of the planet. So if you work with somebody like that, or you're married to somebody like that, or somebody in your family, you know, avoid them as much as you can. But the best thing to do is if you can't in any of these situations, as soon as you're done being around them, is do some of the things we just talked about. Breathe, get your stone, hold it in your hand. I, I hold my stone in my hand when I'm talking to a lot of people because I just want that stuff off of me. I don't want that stuff, but try to avoid them. Then there's a red. Think of hothead. Scenario I give is for like this. So it's a beautiful day. You're going to the beach. The sun is shining. You just get there. The smell of the ocean is awesome. The seagulls are out. A few clouds in the sky. You put the blanket down and they start. Why do we have to come? Why'd you put the blanket here? Don't you see the sun's right over my head? Now I'm going to get burned. Oh, why do people bring their kids to the beach? Am I going to have to listen to these rotten brats the whole day? Oh, great. Seagulls. Now they're going to poop up. And you're just like, what? Oh, what? An E, right? You're never going to change these people, no matter what you do, no matter how many times you talk to them, no matter how many times you scream or you get upset. Just like blues, they'll do what they do. And just like violets, they'll do what they do. You're not going to change them. All you're doing is they're allowing them to harm you. Leave them home or walk away. You, you just got to avoid them because they're not good. So the next two people are not bad people necessarily, but they're annoying. One's a yellow. So think you mellow yellow. They are so mellow, they can't get out of their own way. So what do you want for lunch today? I, 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 don't, I don't know. Are you going to do anything today? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Are you going to get a job? I don't know. I, 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 are you going to do something with your life? <laughs> I, I don't know. They literally are happy to sit in their own filth on a couch and, and just sit there and let their life go by. They have no ambition, no desire to do anything. And they're okay with it. They are fine with it. It's you that has the problem. So when you want to eh, strangle them, you're not fixing them. You're not helping them. You're not changing them. You're affecting yourself. Let it go. Let it go. Again, they're not bad people. They're just annoying. And the last one, I was so thrilled. For those of you who watch Saturday Night Live, they do a perfect, and I wonder if they always wonder if they did it on purpose, a perfect rendition of a pink. A pink aura is a one-upper. I did this first. I had this first. I have more than you. Mine is better than you. So they have a character called Penelope done by Kristen Wiig. And if you've ever seen it before, she's a perfect pink. So if you haven't, this is how it goes. So they're at a dinner party and a couple is talking and the guy says, oh, you guys got to come over this weekend, see my new boat. 
and Penelope comes into the scene as she twirls her hair. I got six boats and four cabins and, and I own all the islands and my boat is bigger than yours. My head. Okay, everybody's looking at her like she's crazy. And this scene pans over to another group where a woman says, I got a $5,000 bonus. And Penelope comes to the scene, twirl her hair. I got a $10,000 bonus and I own the company and everybody works for me. And, and this is what she does. To the point where the person actually takes her size, Penelope, we don't care that you don't have this stuff. You don't have to say it. We like you the way you are. I like you more than you like me and I have more friends than you do. So this is what she does. No matter what you do, you're not going to fix this person. You're not going to make them any different. They're going to be who they are, but they frustrate the heck out of you. So those four people, the green, the red, the yellow, and the pink. Okay. Again, those are earth tone people. So um, hopefully now I'm going to take a drink of water. Uh, Peggy talked to you about animals because animals also have auras because, you know, we all love our pets. So you want to watch them too. And also you can learn to see auras first on other people. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to close with that. Not until you get this fixed, but it's better to start on a pet. So Peggy, go ahead. Yep. Uh, animals do have auras. Um, you know, when you got your dog or your cat sleeping on the floor, you can use them to practice um, because they don't move. <laughs> no, they don't move. <laughs> Unless they're twitching, right? Um, they are very aware of what's going on around them. Uh, they can. Um, they can see your past loved ones better than we can. Um, if you ever see your dog or your cat uh, looking in the corner of a room and tilting their head or uh, a dog growling or um, a cat hissing or her hair going up, take a cue from them. That usually means that one of your loved ones is there. Um, talk to the loved one. If you think that it was your uh, mother who recently passed away say mom if that you come over and touch me um my my dog always uh, used to growl down at the hallway uh, when no one was home toward the room that my mother-in-law uh, lived in um your animals who have passed uh keep their toys their bowls their collars um squeak a toy for them you can feel their energy from their aura come next to you uh you can call them up on your lap and you can feel that energy come to you it's a very amazing thing but just um make sure you keep your uh keep an eye on what your animals are doing around you Thank you, Peggy. What I, I what I always tell people is that, uh, you know, we always know that dogs and stuff like that and cats, they, they sense things. They can sense when somebody's bad, they'll growl. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can sense when somebody's getting ready to have a stroke or when somebody's getting ready to have a seizure. Well, you know what? Dogs are amazing. Cats are amazing. Animals are amazing. But we're supposed to be doing that, too. We are absolutely supposed to be able to be sniffing this stuff out. They're no different than we are, but we can't because our minds are boggled. So we want to get back to that. We want to get back to what we're supposed to have. So what I normally do is I tell people that you can see auras. You have to clear your brain. And what I used to do with these programs is teach people how to see auras. It, it takes a minute, but here's the problem. Every time I say to people, please don't even try to do this until you spent a couple of weeks doing the breathing and that, that and all this other stuff, because you're not going to be able to see auras. And you're going to get disappointed and you're going to forget all about it. And you're going to be upset and you'll excrete some ephedrine. No matter how many times I tell people to do that, I get emails the next day or the next day after that and say, Sydney, I tried to see the aura, but I couldn't see it. They don't listen. They don't, I know that they're so anxious to do it, but I don't want them to be upset because they can't see it. So this is what I tell people all the time. Seeing an aura takes a second. Practicing takes a little bit longer. You do have to practice, but it's so easy to do. Once you get your brain on clutter and you start to feel things and you're sensing things, then uh, take my email. I'm happy to spend time with you five minutes because that's all it's going to take to tell you how to see your aura. I'm going to give you a little teaser here, but I don't want you to do it. You've ever seen any of those books in the 70s called the, the um, Magic Eye? I usually have it here with me, but I don't for some reason now. The magic eye there is a picture. You couldn't see what the picture is until you held the book really close to your face. And as you pulled it out, 
the picture popped out. It's kind of like the same thing with the aura. The aura is right there. It's just you just need to know how to hold your eyes to see it. If you're staring like this and you're blinking, you're not going to see it. It has to be a very nice, relaxed eye and only for a few seconds. And then you close your eyes. And then you open them for a few seconds, very, very light, like you've had a glass of wine or you're getting ready to go to sleep and you close again. And after a while, you're going to see spurts of colors and they'll go away because your brain's trying to get used to this new thing you're trying to do. But then it'll fill in a little bit more and you'll start to see the color and you'll see the placement. And you practice this with people standing still, like up against a white wall with a white shirt on because you don't want anything cluttered. But after you get, have, you're used to seeing this, you don't need that anymore. You can be in the grocery store. You could be in church. You can be in a movie theater. You're going to be like, ah, that one's a blue. Oh, that poor lady. She must have trouble with her left breast. I'm seeing something up here on the breast. Oh, that person over there must be, have suffered some really bad anxiety. I see all oh, stuff. That's what you'll be able to do. And it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to learn how to smell, see, hear, or feel your loved ones. But again, you're not going to do that now because nobody's taught you how to do it. So uh, that is auras. It's a lot of information. Like I said, please go to your local library. Uh, last thing I had to say is I was going to write a book on auras because people always say to me, Sydney, what's the best book out there to buy on auras? There is not one. I'm not saying there's not a good book. There's thousands of them out there. And I haven't read every single one of them, no. But I looked at a large amount of them. And every one I've found Neither are because completely wrong where they're getting their information from. I have no idea. But the other problem is, is that they may talk a little bit about theory, about what the aura is, but they don't tell you anything about the colors. Or they might tell you about the colors, but they don't give you any process to understand, okay, but what does that mean and how does it affect me? There's no one whole book. So I said I was going to write a book on auras, but you know what? I'm old, <laughs> I'm tired. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to continue to do these presentations and explain to people what they need to do and um, hope they listen. People do. I will say the majority of people do listen and they have very great outcomes. Some don't. And when I ask them, well, tell me, what is the problem? I want to help you. What? Tell me, how's it going with your practice? Well, I haven't practiced. Well, then I don't know what to tell you. Have you done the breathing? No, I haven't done the breathing. So, you know, if you can just take yourself five minutes every day, you are well worth it. Put the tape on, sit down for five minutes, put the stone in your hand, have the salt lamp on, put this in and just relax and breathe. You are dumping massive amounts of dopamine. It's five minutes of your day. If you could do it later in the day, do it again. It's well worth it. So hopefully you like the program. It's Sydney Sherman author at yahoo.com. Sydney Sherman author dot com. Wait a minute. Sydney Sherman, yeah, dot, dot com. See, I can't say it and, and not read at the same time. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, can you see all of our, or, no, I cannot. I can't see it in a picture. So, you know, what annoys me because this question comes up and thank you for asking that, Amy. Um, you know, people always say to me, oh, I went to a carnival and I got a picture of my aura. You did not. You paid $30 for a thermal imaging camera. They lied. They lied to you. Imagine that. There is no camera right now known to man that can take a picture of an aura. Not one. It's very soon, probably in the next 10 years, there will be. It'll be through like an MRI imaging type thing. Don't fall for that. That is not a picture of your aura. There is no black auras and there are no white auras. So no, you cannot look in the mirror. You cannot see your own aura. I can't look down like this and see my aura. Uh, so you're learning to see other people's auras and you're learning so you can identify the bad things that are around you, the bad situations, people, environments. And so you can learn to feel what's going on in your body. So you can take advantage of that and make sure you get the treatment or the care ahead of time. Like I said, I have lupus and the doctors have said that they're, not, they're surprised I'm not in a wheelchair with my numbers the way they are. But I'm fine. I walk around and I don't, once in a while I have to go on prednisone. And it's because I reiki all the time. I breathe all the time. I use my stone. My salt lamps are going constantly. I get the stuff off of me. Does it keep you from ever having a problem? No, of course not. We're going to have problems. But it makes it better and we can control it better. And that's what we're supposed to do. So. Um, Sylvia anyway, looks like she's got her hand up. I, yeah, see, I can't see everybody's face. Who's that, Sylvia? Yeah, yes. you okay, got to click ask off a, of you. May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, 
I read in, in one of the books about Edgar Cayce that he was once in the front of the elevator and none of the people when the door opened had orders. So he uh, didn't go into that elevator and those people all died because the elevator crashed. Can you elaborate on that? No, and I'd actually know about it. I've never heard that story. Um, I've never seen a person that didn't have an aura. Um, the only thing I can think of, because again, this is the first time I'm hearing the story, so I'm just trying to, you know, see if I can fathom it, um, is when when people are separating, when people are going through the transition, when they're getting ready to pass for whatever reason, when they start to separate, this is their body, this is their aura, and they start to separate, it does get very faint and very finite it, like it looks like there is nothing there it's the only thing I can think of honestly but I'm probably wrong because these people this was not an impending death that they knew of like a cancer or an old age or something like this this is something that it was an elevator accident um I've never heard that before I do respect Edgar Casey I've read a lot of his stuff but I've never heard that so I can't really answer that question for you I'm sorry but he was a very smart man not to get in that elevator it's probably he listened to his gut his gut instinct probably said, don't do it. And he didn't either. He said something about them or the situation and he didn't do it. So, uh, but that's interesting. Now I'm going to have to, now Peggy, you know, I'm going to have to read about that, right? Peggy. <laughs> All right. I don't know if she's still there. Uh, I'm, does any I'm here. And what you need to do is up in the corner where it says view. Yeah. Press on it and put on uh, gallery. Hey everybody <laughs> oh you're all still here how nice okay so uh yes does anybody else have uh have a question um, i do um so my two nieces um we have figured out probably talk to people spirits um kind of like what you were saying um where they'll all of a sudden be talking to a corner or they'll start referring to a person um been sitting in the room with them. Um, I did one time, and this wasn't even on purpose, but I was videotaping my niece, and there were just like orbs flying all around her that I couldn't explain with um, what was, you know, the lighting in the room or dust, you know, it just it'd be shooting all around her as she was talking. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, because sometimes they get a little scared with they're only four and six. Um, what kind of person would we have them kind of talk to to kind of get them understand like what they're experiencing? Uh, well, that's a good, I have so much to say about that, but I'll try to keep it short. So my, and I'm not pushing the book here. I'm just telling you that. So my second book, Gifted Innocence, actually that's really a picture of me when I was a baby. It was a little picture my mother took. And when my niece did the picture, she put, uh, spirit here because there's pictures of me taking spoons up into the air trying to feed something or putting my arms up in the air to be picked up every one of us when we were children whether we remember or not we were able to see our loved ones we may not have known who they were because we never met them but every one of us see because our brains were not vying for a whole bunch of stuff we uh, we weren't bombarded and we also were biased we weren't told that we're not supposed to do this so we did and so a lot of times kids get scared and I do help, I've helped a lot of kids with this. And unfortunately, and I'm sorry, your name is Amy. Unfortunately, adults sometimes add to it and they don't do it on purpose. I'm not putting any blame there. When children see energy or spirits of dead people, they don't know they're dead. They don't look dead. They actually look very pleasant and very, they're just living people. They're just living people, just like seeing me or you or anybody else. When they start to fear them, that's because somebody, something somewhere has put something in their head where they should. And the parents don't do it on purpose. A lot of times what the parents say is, but I don't see them. Or are these people dead? Or it could be Nani. Nani died like 10 years ago. And the adults usually put stuff in the kid's head which sets them down that pathway or they see a movie or their friends talk about it at school. So the best person to talk to the child and educate the child on this is the parent. It really is. Because you got to take this journey with them so that they don't lose what you had that you can easily get back. So I always tell parents, 
zip it. Just let them talk. Just let them talk. Don't guide them. And it's very hard for parents because they want to, uh-huh, they said that. Oh, what else did they say? And this is fine. That's nice. And yeah, she had this pretty blue dress on. She did. She had a pretty blue dress on. Uh, I like the color blue. Do you like the color blue? Let them talk, but don't give them leading stuff. Um, and don't refer to them as dead. And don't show the pictures and said, oh, well, this is my great, great grandmother over here. She died a long time ago because that scares kids, especially when they learn the word death. As far as orbs go, and Peggy knows this is coming. I've done studies for probably 30 some odd years on orbs. And I don't want to hurt your feelings, Amy, but orbs are not your loved ones. Orbs are everything but them. Our loved ones are not vague. When they're going to present to us, they're going to do it in our face in a physical form. They're not going to be little round circles that show up in every party, every wedding photo, every, you know, graduation from school. Orbs are things that are in the camera, the aperture of the camera. They are dust particles. And I want you to think of it this way. Have you ever seen, and I'm going to ask Amy because she asked a question. Have you ever been in school, maybe you're not old enough, where they shut the lights off, they put a projector on? Uh, or, I do remember those from when I was little, yeah. Okay. Or you go outside at night and you put the flashlight on. Next time, I want you all to do this. When you put a flashlight on, look at the beam of light, all these particles that are falling down in front of the beam that we don't see because they're so tiny. And when light hits it, we don't see it. But those particles are going on. They're all around us right now. They're just floating in the air. We don't see them. We're breathing them in. We're tasting them and everything. That's what's picked up in people's pictures. You're not going to see them, but they're going to show up from the aperture of the camera throws the light on the source. They are bugs, they're moisture. When, when ghost hunting teams go out at nighttime in October, November, December, January, they have a mist, a white mist. I caught an apparition. No, you didn't. It's the breath, your cold breath coming out in front of the camera and your camera caught it. Did you know that you have breath coming out even in the summer, you just can't see it. But the same thing that comes out of your mouth in the winter where you can see it, comes out in the summer, but you just can't see it. It's still being picked up by a camera. So the orbs is a very touchy subject for me because this is where it is. I mean, this is what people think in a lot of these paranormal shows talk about this. So while you're, not you, Amy, people are looking at orbs and chasing orbs and pictures and stuff like that. You're missing what's going on right next to you, the real stuff. While people are looking for dark shadows or shadow people, they're missing what's going on right in front of them. While people are watching the cardinals or the butterflies or the oil in the driveways in the shape of a heart, they're missing. That's not them. It's not them. They're missing what's going on right in front of them. So, but again, you know, unless you know. So there is a way to talk to kids. I'd be happy if you want to email me. I can give you some suggestions. Um, anybody interested, and I forgot to say this before, anybody interested in um, getting my book? As a matter of fact, where'd you go? Janet, do you know if my book's in the library? My You Are Not Alone? I don't, but if it's not, I can recommend that we get it. Uh, just let me know. If you can email, let me know. I'll send you one. Which which one? The, the You Are Not Alone, that one? Um, if I have enough of these, these go pretty, well, actually, they both okay. go pretty quickly, but I will send you both. Just I know you would probably have this, but just let me know. Okay. Uh, but either way, if people if people want their own sign, they can go to my website and get it. They can get it on Amazon, but they're much more expensive and you won't get it signed. If you get them through me from my website, they're cheaper and I sign it. But if um if you you know, I can try to help you, but honestly, don't try to find somebody to talk to your child. You need to talk to your nieces, your whatever. You're the best source because you're gonna be following them on the journey and they need to know they have a relationship and they can talk. Okay. Um, somebody wrote a question down in the chat and I, my chat's not coming up. Um, I can read it to you. It says, um, it's from Sharon, <clears throat> excuse me, from Sharon. If uh, reincarnation is when a soul goes on to take on another body, how can a person's aura of the past person be still available? Okay, so you're, you're, okay, so here's our energy, here's our aura, this is mine, okay? And now I have this physical body. When I leave this physical body, the energy goes back into the vast environment universe around us. So it just still doesn't stay stagnant. It's not just sitting here alone by itself, 
This is the only thing that made it by itself. And now it's back to the vast universe. So they do take the aura with them, the energy with them to the new body. And that's actually what made me turn my opinion around because I was not sure that I was believing in the reincarnation until I started doing some research that they find that a lot of times people are, they have the same traits and characteristics because they have the same aura. If they had problems with their tonsils, they had to have their tonsils removed as a child in their next life, the same thing, they have the problems with the tonsils. So you don't lose that aura itself. You got to remember, it's the physical component of you that makes your biological enzymes. So it's the physical part that makes your gastric juices. So the color might change. The color itself might change depending on this body that you get. But the energy itself doesn't change. The energy is still constant and the energy still can have some of the same traits and characteristics. And where they find them more is in moles or in crooked teeth, like the one I have right here. That's the interesting the thing that I'm finding with reincarnation is it's more physical attributes that you find repeated in different lives. And it's like I said, that's why I felt the need to, to offer up a program. It's, it's new. Like I said, it's new. I haven't even done one yet in the library for 2022 called reincarnation because it's not, again, it's not what people think it is. It really isn't. It wasn't, it's not what I thought it was. Uh, but again, it's also in your library, very well documented, but looking for it in science books, in metaphysical books, stay away from, in physics books, you can find it. So, you know, look in that genre. If you buy a book that just says reincarnation, I don't know what you're going to get. So that's a very good question. Hopefully I answered it the best way I can, because I want to talk about it for like an hour, because it's so interesting, but I can't. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Karen. Uh, what does the burning of sage do? Well, okay, so the burning of sage, you can you can burn anything. It's burning, okay, I'm going to say this as nice as I can, and hopefully I don't offend anybody. If any of you ever went to college and you lived in a dorm, a lot of times what dorm kids do to get the smell of, oh, I don't know, something they're smoking out of their dorm is to burn toast, okay? So anything you burn clears out the environment, breaks up the environment. Well, we don't want to go around smelling burnt toast or other things. Sage works on a certain neurotransmitter in your brain. It's the smell of the sage that most people find enjoyable. It's a very calming oil. Does it work on everybody? No, it doesn't. There's a lot of people like gag with the sage. So that's why I'm saying it's, it's really more of a, we like the sage. I've only found one person who hasn't works very, very well. But if you have another scent that you love and you just feel comforted, then go with that. It's still going to work. If you have a scent that's just like, oh, I kind of like that, but it doesn't make you feel all warm and fuzzy, then don't, then that's not it. And we have Who a else? question uh, from Janine. Mm -hmm. um, she asks uh, if you have any experience in past life regression. I'm very curious in finding out my past. Well, what I, the only thing I did find out, and no, I don't really, and Peggy will tell you, I, people have asked that question before, but um, I'm finding with the studying that I'm doing, what I'm finding out about the reincarnation is past life regression is very closely linked to experiences in reincarnation. Um, I haven't quite put the whole story together yet, and, and I can tell you if I don't have all the facts or all the information, I don't talk about it. So um, I wish I can give you more information about that, but I do believe that it's, it's a legitimate thing and that it is attached to us and sits in probably the dorsal, what they call the dorsal of the occipitable, which retains memories. And I really think that that's where it's coming from. And that's where a lot of reincarnation where people remember things. So let's hear stories about kids where they were airport support, um, they were aircraft bombers or something like that. And they never lived. Those are the repressed memories. So it's basically the same thing. And, and so Janine, I'm trying, I can't really answer the whole question for you, but I can tell you that I'm finding they're attached to a lot of stories of reincarnation, a lot of things that happens. And there is a science to correlate the two of those together. But as far as the rest of it goes, I don't know. If you have a particular topic, I might be able to help you with it. But as far as a you know, vast, broad thing, I, I can't. You can always email me. Um, Karen has a follow-up question about the sage. She yep. asks, 
So burning sage doesn't remove energies out of the room? It removes stagnation. It doesn't remove energies. It removes the stagnation, all the nasty stuff that's in the air around you that has come off of the auras, has come off of the people and been put in your environment. That's what you want gotten rid of. It's not going to release, a re, uh, get rid of an energy like a person. <laughs> okay, it's not going to do that. Um, and you can't use sage or anything to get rid of your loved ones or spirits because they're not going anywhere because they're not supposed to. Um, so hopefully, where is Karen? Hi, Karen. Um, does that make sense, Karen? It, it breaks, it just makes the air environment around you cleaner. It's not getting rid of energies. Yes, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Anybody else? All righty. Um, well, um, go ahead, Janet. If there are no further questions, I, I need to uh, thank Sydney and, and Peggy for joining us and so much information. <laughs> I mean, that's great, but it's like I trying to take it all in. I took a few notes, but um, thank you so much. Um, and I will check the library for your books. And um, we appreciate you uh, sharing everything with us tonight because I, speaking for myself, I did, I did learn a lot. Okay. Well, I appreciate, again, all the topics I talk about from the you are not alone to the understanding your senses to the auras to everything. Again, it's all energy. I, as you can tell, besides the gift to get, I can go on all night with this because it's such a large subject. So I know I gave you a whole bunch of information but I hope if nothing else comes out with you come out with tonight is that you got to take care of you. And I told you how and let what's naturally in you come out. And it's a wonderful thing. It really is. Okay. So. All right. All right. Thank, you, Thank everyone you everyone for joining us. And I hope to see you next week on Thursday when we have our next program. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks Thank again. Thank you. Stay warm. Mm.